Uh, I do have to correct one thing, Zach. Uh, I haven't written 17 books. I've written one book 17 times. <laughs> Once you write one, then they want you to write another one, and I only had a little bit to say, so. I was asked, I asked what my job was tonight, and I was told that I'm the principal speaker, and uh, I'm a money guy, so I looked up the word principal. And that's what's left when all the interest is gone. <laughs> Jim Dobson says that being a principal speaker is a little bit like being a corpse at a funeral. You need them to hold the event, but you really don't expect them to say much. So I hope that I can say a few things. And I've titled this talk, uh, Wall Street to Africa to Main Street. And the reason is that's my testimony. I graduated from uh, Indiana University with an MBA in 1967, uh, 51 years ago, uh, and went to work on Wall Street with uh, the largest uh, accounting firm in the world at the time, Pete Marwick Mitchell, which is now KPMG, and uh, spent three years there, and then I started a CPA firm uh, and worked uh, at that for seven years. Uh, and then uh, during that period of time, uh, the Lord uh, called me uh, and he called me into full-time ministry in 1977. And the, I, I, my job was, <clears throat> I was uh, working with a uh, subsidiary of Campus Crusade for Christ. And my job uh, at the time was to travel to Africa to help with some evangelistic campaigns. And so I made uh, 10 trips to Africa in about 24 months of time. And it changed a lot in terms of my worldview and my thinking, and I'll share a bit of that. But I want to introduce that uh, by uh, sharing just uh, a bit about this person, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, most of you should know who Sherlock Holmes is, and Sherlock Holmes or was a fictional character, but he and Dr. Watson went on a camping trip, and after a good night, uh, after a good meal and a bottle of red, they lay down for the night and went to sleep. Some hours later, Holmes woke up, nudged his faithful friend, and said, Watson, I want you to look up at the sky and tell me what you see. Watson said, I see millions and millions of stars. And Sherlock said, as a good detective, and what does that tell you? After a minute or so of pondering, Watson said, well, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo, and horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three in the morning. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, I suspect that we will have a beautiful day today. What does it tell you, Sherlock? Holmes was silent for about 30 seconds, and he said, Watson, you idiot. Someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> so this is what they both saw, but what they really saw depended upon their perspective. And perspective drives everything. And so what I'm going to be sharing with you uh, really is out of my perspective of having worked in the financial services world for 50 years, 40 of which have been spent mostly with Christians, and I've answered thousands of questions. I've uh, uh, written books and uh, talked a lot about money. So I have a perspective. And I'll tell you a little bit about my story. Uh, this is a picture of Judy and I on our wedding day in 1965, and it'll be 53 years uh, next Tuesday that we have been married. <laughs> she was beautiful then, and she's beautiful today. And this was our first home. And you can see we didn't necessarily start out with uh, everything. In fact, that trailer was 28 feet long it was eight feet wide and six feet tall. You could sit on the pot, do the ironing, and cook dinner without moving. <laughs> and when Judy did the ironing, she reminded me that I either had to get out of the trailer or go to the back of the trailer because you couldn't have the ironing board and me in our living room at the same time. It just wasn't big enough. 
I had a couple of fraternity brothers that were prof ended up being professional basketball players. They couldn't get in our trailer. They were just too big. So we had to invite them over when we did, when it wasn't raining, so that, they, so that we could spend time with them. But the reality was that at that particular point in time, life was a little bit simpler. You know, we didn't have to make decisions on where we were going to eat. We were just happy to have food to eat. And when we were running out of food, we'd go home to our parents and hope that they would send us home with something. We didn't have to worry about what cars we were going to buy. We didn't have to worry about what clothes we were going to buy. We didn't have to worry about 401ks, 403bs. We didn't have to worry about college education. We didn't have to worry about a lot of things. Now, was it a good life? Well, yeah, it was a good life, but it was certainly a simple life. But time passes and life does become more complex. This is a picture that was taken at a family vacation a couple of years ago, and there's 23 of us in that picture. We had five children. We had three girls and then two boys, and they've had 13 grandchildren amongst them. And so we now have 23 of us. And as the family has gotten older, it has caused a lot more confusion, a lot more complexity. I don't know how many college educations I've paid for, how many cars I've bought, but life became a lot more complex. Was it better? Yeah, in a lot of ways it was better. But to, to, to realize that over time, life does become more complex. And I want to share with you kind of the perspective from the trailer to this. And that's my perspective having lived through it. And I think when we think of finances, we think like this. It's a massive puzzle. It's a thousand-piece puzzle. Where do I start? What do, what do I do? Because all of, we have all of this coming at us, and what we really want is the picture. We, we really want to be able to say that at the end of our life, we have built a picture. We start out with all of these pieces, and we put them together, and what we want is a picture. Um, I want my life to be complete. I want my life to be pretty. I want my life to have accomplished something. I want my life to be purposeful. I want my life to be meaningful. I want to have relationships. Uh, I want money to play the proper role in my life. But what we have is we, we live in a very complex world, and it's getting more complex because of the sharing of information. That's not new news. That's not unique to me. But I want to share something with you. In uh, November of 1959, there was a letter written from John Steinbeck to Adlai Stevenson. John Steinbeck was an author. And Adlai Stevenson had been ambassador, was ambassador to the United Nations, had run for president twice, and was a very well-respected man. And in this letter, which I have a copy of, this is what John Steinbeck said. This was a part of the letter. He said, a strange species we are. We can stand anything that God and nature can throw at us, save only plenty. And if I wanted to destroy a nation, I would give it too much and I would have it on its knees, miserable, greedy, and sick. Now, I was a senior in high school in 1959. I didn't know about this letter until just many years ago. But I have lived long enough to see this fulfilled. Because in 1959, if you had a 1,200 square foot home, you were rich. If you had a garage, you were rich. Nobody had two cars. And uh, it was a different world then. There, there wasn't, I remember taking vacations. We didn't have air conditioning in cars. Now, was it a good time? Well, I remember the 50s as a pretty good time. Uh, I have some very good memories of the 50s. But if, if you looked at that, but I do know this, that in the 50s, we were driven by a lot of fear. And the fear we had was the fear of nuclear war. It was the fear of the unknown. We uh, had just come out of two wars. 
uh, and we're entering into a Cold War. It was not a time of contentment, if you will. Well, now we have seen in 50 years, 60 years, the run-up in wealth that the world has never seen. This is the richest culture that the world has ever seen by far that we live in. And I would ask the question, has our, has our level of contentment gone up? Has our morality gone up? And the answer is no. As a matter of fact, I think it may be worse today than it was in 1959, and yet we, the wealth that we have is, is really incomprehensible. Um, my story is this. I was born in 1950 through 52, lived through the greatest economic growth that the world has ever seen. I've experienced tremendous swings in the market. Uh, when I was born, the market was about two or 300. I've lived through uh, the market. To, to see the market at 25, 26, 27,000 is incomprehensible. Nobody, nobody, nobody predicted something like that. I've lived through economic fear. If I go back and look at my life, every period of my life has had fear, be it the Vietnam War, be it the Watergate crisis, be it the assassination of John Kennedy, be it double-digit inflation in the 80s, be it Y2K in the 90s, be it 9-11 in 2000, be it the stock market crash in 2008. I can tell you a lot of bad news in the 50 years. Um, so I've lived through that economic fear, and then the question is, well, how do you handle the fear of the unknown? We're going to try to answer that. And, but I've also lived with clients making financial decisions, both good and bad, and with a lot of dollars. And for 50 years, I've been in the financial services world, and here's the questions. How much is enough for freedom? Freedom from what? And I think freedom from? the bondage of fear. If you look at Romans 8, 15, a hopeful chapter in the Bible, it talks about being in bondage to fear. I believe that almost all of us, at, I know at one point or another we experience fear. It's the fear of failure. It's the fear of rejection. It's the doubts that come. It's the worry that comes. My mother was a worrier. She used to worry about not worrying. I went to Africa one time, came back, and I hadn't told her I was going to Africa. And when I got back, she's, I called her and she said, well, I, you should have told me because I could have worried. <laughs> and I said, Mom, 90% of the things you worry about never happen. And she says, that proves worrying works. <laughs> she was a slave to, uh, to worry. But freedom from the bondage of fear. Wouldn't we like to be free from the bondage of fear? If I had no fears of anything in my life, there's a freedom to that, and there's a bondage to fear. I think there is a slavery to comparison today, and that we, we look at other people and judge ourselves vis-a-vis -vis other people. There, that's a fear also. I think we're addicted to image, and I've watched this. And I don't think I'm a subject to that, but I think as a culture, we're really addicted to image. <laughs> you know, um, I don't know how to get on Instagram. I don't have Facebook. I don't have Twitter. So I'm glad. I am really glad because I, uh, I keep hearing these people, well, I saw this on Instagram. I saw this on Instagram. Does anybody ever show bad pictures on Facebook? I don't know because I don't do Facebook. But we're addicted to this stuff. And as a consequence, we're in bondage to it. And what we really want is to live a life that's really a life and a life of freedom. Um, I think that this is what we would, would really, really like. Well, God gave me uh, a mission in uh, 1979, and the mission was to help Christians plan and manage their money so they'd have more money to give away to help fund the fulfillment of the Great Commission. I'd already had 10 years in the financial services world. I'd had two years traveling to, uh, to Africa, and uh, my first client is in this picture. Uh, Judy and I are on the left, 
the fellow that uh, took over uh, Ronald Blue and Company when I left is next to Judy and I. And then you have Bert and Jan Harned. And uh, this was uh, in 1980, and I took Bert to Africa with me, and next to him is an, was another client of mine who was a fraternity brother of mine who was a heart surgeon. Bert was the first client that I have, and when I did a financial plan for Bert, uh, he said he wanted to give away a million dollars. He was the first client that paid me a fee for any advice. And I said, well, what's your income? And he said, $85,000 a year. I said, well, what's your net worth? He said, maybe three or 400,000. And he wanted to give away a million dollars. Now I said, that's impossible. But when we gathered all of his information, we put together a plan for him, he was able to give a million dollars away. And technically, the way he was, reason he was able to do that was he had property he didn't, he'd forgotten about. He had a lot more net worth than what he really knew, and which is true of most people. So we started giving away the property, which reduced his taxes, which increased his cash flow, which increased his ability to give, which reduced his taxes, which increased his cash flow, which increased his ability to give. You run all that out for five years, and he was able to give away a million dollars. Uh, he actually did it. He wrote me a letter 18 years later, and he said this, you asked me to mention my financial situation, uh, and he gives a couple of compliments. Since I quit working, retired, my net worth has increased every year, and I've been able to up my giving every year over anything while I was working. So now I'm giving more than I am spending on all my living expenses. Good. And I continue to plan this trend. And he's now 96 years old uh, and still giving at a maximum rate. He is the prototype of what I think is available for all of us in, in the Christian world. Well, when we were on this trip, we went to visit a pastor who lived in a mud hut. This is not the actual picture of the mud hut, but it depicts the mud hut. And we were, in fact, the mud hut was just down to the left of where this picture was. And uh, the pastor that we were visiting lived in the mud hut. He had five children, one room, mud hut, thatch roof. And I asked him, I said, what is the greatest barrier to the spread of the gospel in this part of the world? And I would have thought he would have said something like money or communication or transportation or tribalism or something like that. But what he said was the greatest barrier to the spread of the gospel is materialism. I said, materialism? What do you mean? How can that possibly be? He said, well, if a man has a mud hut, he wants a stone hut. If he has a thatch roof, he wants a metal roof. If he's got one acre, he wants two acres. If he's got one cow, he wants two cows. And that helped me define the real root issue when it comes to money. And the root issue when it comes to money is that money is always a heart issue. It's not a money issue. It's always a heart issue. And the bondage that we have is wanting more. Now, I'm not saying having more is wrong, but what I'm saying is that when we want it, when we want it more than we want the Savior, we're in bondage. And that's why Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. He didn't say it was hard to. He said it's impossible. He said you have to make the choice. And the God of mammon rules this world for sure. So us as believers live in a world ruled by the God of mammon, and we're fighting a battle. And it's a very real battle because the world tells us something, and it's a lie for the most part. Uh, and I'm not saying you have to give everything away to be happy at all. I'm just saying that your perspective drives everything. That's why I started with that slide. Because your perspective, of, if you believe that God owns it all, and if you believe that you're bound for eternity, then you've got things in the right perspective. My son gave a speech uh, some time ago. And he was, I was asking him about it, and he said that he used an illustration. He was talking about retirement, and he was talking to a group like this, 
And he was saying, how many of you are worried about your retirement or concerned about your retirement? Well, everybody was concerned about their retirement, which may have been 30 years into the future. He said, how many of you are worried about what you're going to eat or what you're gonna, uh, where you're going to sleep or what you're going to wear 35 million years from now when you're in eternity? How many of us worry about what we're going to eat and wear and how we're going to live? when we get to heaven. We don't worry about that. And that's the way Jesus wants us to live right now, is free from that bondage. But I think a relevant, in fact, I, I wrote a quote down here that the desire for more will always disappoint because we'll never know when enough is enough. And enough is never enough. So when we reach a particular point, We'll never know if that's enough. It'll always disappoint us because there may be something more out there. So is it a million dollars? Is it a million and a half? Is it two million? Is it 10 million, 100 million? What is it? How much is enough? And we can never, ever answer that question. The Bible answers it, however. The Lord said in Hebrews 13, 5, be content with what you have. That's the key right there. If I am content with what I have, I will never be content with what I don't have. But I can be content with what I do have. So I think a legitimate question, is God's Word relevant in today's financial environment? Is there something out there that says that this is no longer relevant? And um, I was testifying before a congressional subcommittee, and the senator asked me, he said, what would, what would you tell the American family about their money? And I said, Senator, I would tell them to spend less than they earn, avoid the use of debt, build liquidity into their finances, uh, set long-term goals so that they prioritize their spending between the short-term and the long-term, and give generously. And he picked up his pencil, repeated them back, wrote them. And he said, well, it seems to me that that'd work at any income level. He was a senator, he was a smart guy. And I said, you're right, Senator, including the United States government. <laughs> now, here's the point. This is the Wall Street Journal. Is it relevant? Yeah, it's relevant. It's knowledge. There's good information in here. But the date's March 13th. Is it still relevant? Have to read it every day to stay current. Now, how, how relevant is this? There's more said about money in the Bible than any other topic. 2,350 verses, according to Howard Dayton. Two thirds of the Lord's parables deal with money in one way or another. Why? Because money is at the root of, of the heart. So here's the issue can we take these two and put them together? And, and I think the answer to that is yes. You need knowledge, but you need to apply knowledge with wisdom. Knowledge alone will not solve your problems, will not answer the questions that you have. But wisdom applied to knowledge is the way to live life from financially. So is, the, is God's Word relevant today? You bet it is. I look at it this way that you've got a financial world. In fact, uh, Eugene Peterson, when he wrote the message, in the introduction to the message, he said this. He said, I was a theologian for 15 years, and then I was a pastor for a number of years. Uh, and he said, I realized that there were two languages. There was the language of the theologian, and there was the language of the person sitting in the pew. And he wrote the message to put the two together. And I believe that in, in my life, that's what God has done two and four and through me. For whatever reason, he's allowed me to experience finance, finances at the highest level, but he's taught me that the language of the Bible is the only language that'll work. It's not that one and the, uh, or the other are exclusive. It's how you apply the knowledge that you have. So if you take the financial wisdom and you apply the biblical wisdom, I think you get financial wisdom. And what you get uh, is 
a principle-driven di- uh, process of thinking about money. And I believe this, that a biblical approach to personal finance is the only rational approach to money management and works at all times for every person in every circumstance of life. Now, I'm 76, spent 50 years in the financial services world, and that's my conclusion. And you can't argue with me. (laughs) Now, you can argue with me. But I've got an awful lot to back that up. And I made this statement to a pastor, and uh, the pastor uh, said to me, he said, well, Ron, he said, if that's the case, why is the church not perceived as the center of financial wisdom? That's a really good question. Because in reality, this is the only way to think about money And how you think about money is how you will act with money. And I'll give you, uh, you've got a handout, and I'm going to go over that uh, in just a couple minutes. We've already talked about fear. Here's some of the reasons that fear is relevant. Eighty percent of women will experience widowhood. Interestingly, uh, and the average age of widowhood is 57. Now, there's a financial planning principle there, and that is, men, if your wife is approaching age 57, you're almost dead. (laughs) So you may want to think about a younger wife. (laughs) Well, it doesn't say anything about how old the man is. It just said how old the women are. Interesting, too, within the next 10 years, uh, 60 to 70 percent of the wealth in America will be held by women. Today, it's just less than 50 percent of wealth is held by women. And part of it is this reason, is 80% of women will experience widowhood. That's just, that's a fact. That's not anything other than that. And that in uh, 12 years, well, here it is, two-thirds of the wealth in the U.S. will be held by women. Uh, 80% of Americans have more debt than they have assets. That's the bad news. The good news is they don't know it because they keep borrowing their way to prosperity, they think. And in reality, from an accounting standpoint, they're bankrupt. Well, we've got the uncertainty of the economy. We've got stock market collapses. We've got real estate collapses. We've got rising college costs. We've got aging parents. There's a lot of reason for there to be fear, if you will, when you look at it just from the factual standpoint. But here's what Jesus says. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who built his house on the rock. The rains fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its its foundation was on the rock, rock. And I have a picture of this verse. This is a house on Galveston Island after Hurricane Ike. I don't remember the year of Hurricane Ike, but it hadn't been very long ago. And this is the only house, this is the house that was, you can see that it was damaged by the hurricane. However, look at this picture. Same house. The only house standing. And the story behind the house is that the people had lived through a hurricane before, and they built a hurricane-proof house. They built it on the rock. And when the winds came and the rivers rose and uh, the floods came, that house was damaged, but it was still standing. And here's what I will assure you, that if you follow what I said, those five principles of money management, when the winds come and the rivers rise, you'll still stand. Because when you ask yourself, could I have done anything differently? And when you follow those five fundamental biblical principles, the answer to that is no. I might get damaged by a real estate market collapse or stock market collapse or a medical emergency or things like that, but the reality is God in His faithfulness has said this is profoundly simple. It is not difficult. If you live by my wisdom and by my principles, when the winds come, you will survive. 
you will have done everything that you could do in preparation. It doesn't mean that you won't be injured, but it does mean, just like this house, it'll be the only house standing. I think it's a terrific picture. And it, what it really says is that principle-based decision-making always leads to competence. When, you have, when, you're, when you're following principle-based decision-making. Well, what we would like to do is, uh, I wanna help you now, and here's the thousand piece puzzle. When you start to put together a puzzle, what's the first thing you do? Do what? The edge pieces. You look for the four corners, right? If you can find the four corners, that's where you start. I think another thing that you do is you look at the picture to see what the end result is. Well, a framework is a way to frame your thinking. And what you have that we handed out tonight is a framework. It's a four-piece framework. And what I want to do is just kind of quickly go over the, the framework. And the framework is the four corners. And as you work your life out through the framework, you build a picture. And what you're trying to do is to put those pieces together, but you have to do it within the framework. So, first of all, it, we call it the 4-H framework, and it begins with your heart. Behavior follows belief, and your heart drives everything. Secondly, is your health. And your health, there's only five things you can do with money. And how you allocate among those five things is a picture of your health. And we call it live, give, owe, grow. How you spend your money to live, how you spend money to give, how you spend your money on your debt, how you spend your money on your taxes, and how you spend money to grow it. Those are the only five things you can do with money. And when you put it all in a pie chart and look at it, you see the priorities of life. And we'll dig down on that just a bit. Thirdly, the five habits of money management. So you got five uses and five habits. The five habits, spend less than you earn, avoid use of debt, build liquidity, set long-term goals, and give generously. Those are the five habits. If I apply the five habits to the five uses, that's how I manage money. And God's Word has something to say about all of them. And lastly, when I apply the five habits to the five uses with God's perspective, I end up with hope and I build my financial future by following that profoundly simple process of managing money. And I build a picture of a life, and it's, that's it. It isn't any more difficult than that. And what you have in front of you is all those, those four corners, but what you also have is the Scripture behind them. Every one of those little pieces to that framework is supported by God's Word. And this is what I found over the 50 years of working in finances, is that God's Word speaks to every aspect of your finances at all times. And He promises in James 1.5 to give me supernatural wisdom when I ask for it. So the framework that you have is professionally proven. It works, and it works at all income levels, in all cultures, at all times. It works for governments, it works for businesses, it works for marriages, it works for everything. It works for churches, ministries, etc. It's profoundly simple, but professionally proven, and it's lifetime in its application. The reality is, is that if you get it, you've got a tool in your hands that'll never change in terms of your ability to think. Uh, biblically about money and money management. Billy Graham said this, if a person gets his attitude toward money straight, it will has, help straighten out almost every area of his life because all of life runs through your checkbook. If I, wanted, if I wanted to know what your goals and values and priorities are, all I'd have to do is take a look at your checkbook and we would know. And that's not a condemning thing. That's just a reality thing. You could take a look at my checkbook. And what you would see is a life that's lived like this. 
You know, sometimes it's going well, other times it's not going well, but it's in the process of life that I'm learning how to live in reliance and faith upon the Lord. Um, I guess I didn't have that up, did I? Okay, now it is, now you see it. Um, if we take a look at the heart, we'll just dr drill down on these very, very briefly. Um, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's kind of the, the sum total. And you cannot be slaves of God and money. I like my, the translation that I use in the Bible says, it doesn't say you cannot serve God and money, it says you cannot be a slave to God and to money. And then the, the health is, there's a pie chart. And you can spend money to live, you can spend money to give, you can spend money to pay off your debt, you can spend money to pay your taxes, and you can spend money to grow. And you know, or you can find out in about 30 minutes what four of those five are. If you take your tax return out, you know what, you see what your income is, you see what you pay in taxes, you know what you give in charitable dollars, you know what you're paying in debt, and you know what you're saving. So if I look at my income, do I subtract the other four? What's left is what I'm spending to maintain my life. It's all of the groceries and the entertainment and the, everything else about life is in that live category. And live is the, typically uh, the biggest category. But when you, <clears throat> when you fill that puzzle out, and I tell you, you can go on our website and get an uh, Excel tool to fill it out and it populates the, um, uh, the, the pie chart. And the, the website is ronblueinstitute.com uh, forward slash four spelled out H tool. Uh, and you can get a download of a uh, narrative supporting what you have in your hands as well as uh, the tool. But here's the, the fun thing about this. I, I did my own pie chart a few years ago. I'd never done it and I did it and I I took it to my wife, and I said, what do you think? And she looked at it. She spent about 30 seconds looking at it. And she said, we're doing okay, aren't we? And I said, yeah, I've been telling you that for 35 years, and I've got spreadsheets to prove it. That didn't impress her in the least. What it is is a picture of your priorities. It's a great communication tool because a husband and wife can look at that and say, do we like the way we're allocating the income or don't we? So it's a terrific tool. And it communicates two things. Number one, that the uses of money are simultaneous and they're competing with one another. That's not unusual. When you spend money in one wedge, it takes it away from the other four. You can cut it up any way you want, but you still only have one pie. And that, that says that, there's only, that there are no independent financial decisions. The habits, spend less than you earn. Give generously. Avoid the use of debt. Set long-term goals. Build margin. That's all there is to it. So you got your pie chart, you got your puzzle, you got the heart. Um, and then you put it together this way. Spend less than you earn, that really affects your lifestyle. Avoid the use, or give generously. Uh, pay your taxes, I, I believe this, when you pay your taxes, you should be on your knees in gratitude. Why? Because taxes are symptomatic of income. And who gives us the income? Taxes are not something evil. They're symptomatic of the income that we have. So I tell people, thank God that I get to pay taxes. It means that I have the cash to pay taxes and I've had the income that I have to pay taxes. That's contrary thinking. That's not necessarily, it's un-American in a lot of ways, but it's the truth. Uh, avoid debt uh, and, and, and build margin. So here's how it's concluded. A life that is really life is in the Bible, it says, instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. God means for how we use money to be an enjoyment, not a burden, 
not a fear-driven thing, but something to enjoy. He's the one that provides it for us. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the age to come so that they may take hold of a life that is really life. That's what God intends for us. He wants me to send it on ahead. He wants me to enjoy this life and build a foundation. So the answer to the question of how much is enough, enough is never enough. And we break the power of money through generosity, and here's the conclusion. Jesus is the God of security. He's the God of significance, and he's the God of success. Everything that we want, that we think money can provide, only Jesus can provide it. And that's what he shows us in his word, and that's what he shows us, and I hope that I've communicated that to you tonight, and I appreciate your taking some time out on a Thursday night to come Listen to me. Thank you. Or listen to God, I hope. Thank you. Mm.